the Mandalorian finale starts out right where the last episode left off. Stupidly, and it's one long Michael Bay fight sequence again. Mr. Bay, can you think of any ideas? An 18-wheeler spins out of control and it's all like brush in this huge tanker full of diamonds. Crawl! Crawl! Those aren't ideas, Crawl. those are special effects. I don't understand the difference. I know you don't. Get him out of here! This episode was sadly pretty crappy, and this is so much worse than The Clone Wars. I'm on watching parts of Season 5 of The Clone Wars now, and do you know what The Clone Wars has that The Mandalorian doesn't? It has characters. It also has better choreographed fight scenes and some cracking episodes in Season 5. But it has characters. Do you remember characters, Disney? We're now at the end of Season 3 of The Mandalorian, and even the titular character is barely fleshed out. Of the two long-standing characters, Baby Yoda and Mando, Baby Yoda talks in gurgles and baby noises, and Mando is somewhat less expressive than that. Much like the series True Lies, there doesn't seem to be much enthusiasm coming from the leading man, and it again comes off like Disney have shot up Pedro Pascal with horse tranquilizers. This episode is mostly fights between Imperials in Mandalorian armor, who have no characters, that have not been established as either villains or as good fighters, fighting against Mandalorians in multicolored armor, also with no characters. It was maybe a mistake to never have them take their helmets off because it's very hard to empathise with any of these people, if there are even people in that armour. Maybe if I could have seen the torment on the father's face when his son was taken by a dragon a few episodes ago, I would have felt something. But just seeing a mask is like looking at a mannequin in a shop window. I've had more emotional investment in a battle between the players on a foosball table or rock'em sock'em robots than I did the Mandos fighting the Dark Troopers. They needed to take the time to build up the bad guys in order to have a good crescendo and this show hasn't. It's never done that. I don't even know what the Dark Troopers are in this episode. They were robots at the end of last season but these ones seem to groan when they get hit. They seem weaker a lot weaker, the new Dark Troopers are very easy to overpower up close and can be finished with lasers or hurt with a headbutt. The ones from Season 2 could punch through a blast door. The only way Din Djarin did one in last time was by using his Beskar Spear. The Beskar Spear that he then melted down to make into armour for Grogu that Grogu doesn't even wear. So it's a good job those Dark Troopers didn't show up after Mando destroyed the only weapon that he had that could hurt them for no reason whatsoever. He did this because the armourer told him that Beskar was for armour, not for weapons. You know, apart from when she took some Beskar and made it into the Whistling Bird weapon for the Mandalorian in Season 1, or the fact that she's been into battle a few times this season, and every time she waded in with her hammer and tongs, using them as weapons when they're also supposedly made of Beskar. But look at me expecting the show to agree with its own continuity. It's all a bit of a up really. But before I get into the review, I need to talk more about Bo-Katan, because I've been watching more Clone Wars to find out more about the characters that Disney saw fit to make the heroes of a live-action TV show. Last episode, I talked about Bo-Katan being in the terror group The Death Watch, who bombed a war memorial, and I wanted to be fair. The Death Watch did many bad things in the Clone Wars, including assassination. But in the earlier episodes of Clone Wars in Season 2 that featured the Death Watch, Bo-Katan did not appear to be there. So maybe, maybe she didn't know what the Death Watch were about when she joined, and holding her as guilty for the activities of her group is kind of guilt by association. It's a tricky one though, because the longer you're with a group and the worse their actions, the more unfeasible it becomes that you're just blameless and didn't know what was going on. Katie Sackhoff, who plays Bo-Katan, did not appear until The Clone Wars Season 4, Episode 14, A Friend in Need. In this episode, Jedi Knight Ahsoka Tano, who's getting her own series, gets taken against her will to a meeting with the Death Watch, and this is the first appearance of Bo-Katan listed on IMDb. Bo is told Ahsoka is betrothed to the man she's with as a cover, and Bo-Katan calls Ahsoka skinny and slaps her bottom. Uh, right, right. Betrothed. Little 
real skinny, isn't she? <gasps> oh. But so what? So Bo-Katan's a bit handsy. I mean, it'll be a bit awkward if they meet again in the Mandalorian or Ahsoka show. As long as it doesn't get worse, it gets worse. While Ahsoka talks to the Death Watch, the local people of the planet come in and interrupt. The Death Watch had come to their world and kidnapped members of their families to make them comply, and the local's leader wants the return of his granddaughter and the rest of their families, and he wants for the Mandalorians to leave and stop stealing all of their food. The Mandalorian's leader, Pre Vizsla, a relative of Gatling Laser Guy from the Mandalorian, agrees to the terms. The next morning, the Death Watch go to their village. The architecture's nice. It looks to be styled like East Asia. That gate looks a lot like a Japanese Torii gate that denotes holy ground. Pre Vizsla then gives the granddaughter back. And then impales the unarmed civilian girl through the chest from behind with the Darksaber in front of her grandfather. And then orders the killing of the entire town of unarmed civilians. The Death Watch start burning the buildings and people with flamethrowers. Boy, what are you doing? Never let the weak tell you what to do. Welcome to Death Watch. Ahsoka tries to stop them, and the Death Watch try to kill her, including Bo-Katan, who tries to shoot Ahsoka in the face multiple times, and then Ahsoka flees the planet in a ship with the man, Lux Bonteri. We also learn later that Bo-Katan knew the Death Watch intended to end the life of her own sister. Stay focused. Mandalore will soon be ours, and Maul and his brother will be dead alongside the Duchess. And she gave no complaint, and Satine Kreese deserved so much better than what she got. These people are what Disney saw fit to try and make the heroes of a TV show. They didn't choose some group of Mandalorians who didn't have a very negative history. They chose these guys. And during this episode, these are the guys who reclaim Mandalore. These guys get a happy ending. These religious zealots who flamethrower civilians. They now get a fresh start. By the end of this episode, Bo-Katan is ruling Mandalore. I'm looking forward to future projects at Disney Lucasfilm, where presumably they'll be doing a jolly sitcom for kids about the quirky and frequently off-the-wall antics of the Vaffan SS. This would be a war crime, but they weren't even at war with the people they flamethrowered. They just did it for fun, and it's not that the Mandalorians have moved on since then. The fact that the armourer's helmet has horns on it is dubious as hell as well. Because the only Mandalorians that had horns on their helmets were the Death Watch, who were followers of the Sith Lord Darth Maul. These are bad guys. In a fight against the Dark Troopers and Moff Gideon, who were the bad guys supposed to be? Because I think on balance, the Death Watch have done worse things than Moff Gideon. Look, Disney, if you're going to try and do this, if you're going to try and rehabilitate the wicked stepmother from Snow White, if you're going to try and make a hero out of Cruella de Vil, can I just get a Palpatine prequel? Because that could actually be interesting. Maybe Palpatine's time as an apprentice to Darth Plagueis. Darth Bane Path of Destruction is an interesting book that would make quite a series. Sith are good to watch, but they should maybe do more stuff like The Clone Wars. I would argue that there are episodes of The Clone Wars that are better in quality than any episode of The Mandalorian. Some of them also aren't, but Clone Wars cost quite a bit at an estimated $1 million per episode, whereas The Mandalorian, an estimated whopping $15 million per episode. I suppose it all depends on what makes money though. Disney are certainly not here for the art and love of cinema at this point. Anyway, back to the episode. Mando has been captured, Bo-Katan and the rest are running away from an easily winnable fight, and Axe Woves was jetpacking into orbit to contact the rest of the Mandos still on the ships. He's contacted by Bo-Katan, that warns him They're sending up fighters to destroy the fleet. Evacuate everyone. Use the capital ship as a decoy. We can't beat them in the air. We have to beat them on the ground. Understood. And what makes Bo-Katan think that their fleet can't win in the air? She doesn't even know how many fighters and bombers Moff Gideon has launched. 
She could maybe guess, based on how many she saw a few episodes ago, there were maybe 20. Because they show the Mandalorian fleet, and the show is wildly inconsistent with itself from episode 3 of this same season, and this is a problem right away. The Mandos have maybe 10 or so of the same gauntlet starfighter that Bo-Katan used when her and Mando knocked out five fighters in episode 3. And they also have other fighters and what appears to be something that looks like a Venator class star destroyer. And it doesn't look quite right. I think this is actually Moff Gideon's Arkitan's light cruiser that they captured at the end of last season. And seeing as the shields on Bo-Katan's fighter were taking hits from the TIE fighters and surviving, they're going to do nothing to a cruiser, surely. Or they're just going to blow pieces off it right away. Where are its shields? What are the lasers on an Imperial TIE fighter capable of doing in this show? Barely scratching the paint on a fighter or blowing holes in a capital ship? Pick one. You can't have both depending on what's convenient to the plot at the time. Why would anyone want a capital ship in Star Wars at this point? They can't even take hits from fighters. All of the Mandos land on the planet to join the fight. There's a mid-air battle between Mandalorians and Dark Troopers. The armourer, even unfeasibly and laughably, comes in with her battle tongs again. And most of the battle happens off camera. I can only presume the Mandalorians win because Bo-Katan shows up later for the boss fight with Moff Gideon after she shoots two Dark Troopers using her knee rockets. Meanwhile, Din Djarin escapes his captors. He beats two guards up despite being tied. For some unknown reason, Gideon chose not to disarm him, didn't take his helmet or armour, and this is just like the Dark Trooper from last season that punched Mando in the helmet hard enough to drive his head into the ship's hull yet wasn't clever enough to take the helmet off first. I'm not sure why Gideon even left Mando alive at all. What does he want him alive for? Look, if he has to break what little character he has to make the story work, maybe think up another story. In the fight against the Dark Trooper guards, Mando stuns one with a headbutt. So Beskar armour, it appears, can take a laser blast point blank or be pounded into a ship's bulkhead, but a headbutt is too much for it. Mando is about to get off though, when he's saved by a Grogu Ex Machina. No, 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 no. Mando and Grogu then fight their way through the base, looking for Gideon and beating up a lot more dark troopers. They blow up a lab full of Gideon clones, and then they find Gideon, who now has a mech suit of Mandalorian armour, making him almost invulnerable and far stronger. The Red Praetorian guards come to help Gideon, then Bo-Katan comes to help too, and Gideon crushes her hand and the Darksaber with it. Which is a shame. I mean, what's she going to use to impale unarmed girls through the back with now? But even together they can't beat Gideon. And in the end, he's only stopped when Axe Wobes decides to crash the capital ship into the Imperial base for reasons. Where all of his Mandalorian friends were as well, but whatever. He just happens to hit Gideon with his own capital ship. But we don't see him die. He only gets engulfed by flames. So they can technically bring him back again if they want to. They can parachute him in again for a tedious finale to season 4. The religious cell at Mandalorians then resettle Mandalore. Bathe in the living waters next to the Godzilla monster. And Mando and Grogu fix up IG-11 and go off bounty hunting together. Now, I rewatched the Mandalorian season 2 finale again for this. Gideon was going to shoot himself and Cara Dune stopped him. And all of this trouble was because of them keeping Gideon alive at the end of last season. In retrospect, why was Gideon going to end his life anyway? He must have known he'd be rescued. He got rescued by his own dark troopers. But look at me being cute and expecting any kind of sense or continuity in this story. They didn't even remember before they tried to make Bo-Katan a hero that they'd previously written her as a member of a terror group. A monster who killed civilians and conspired to murder her own sister for political power. Those look good. 
A big salty clam would sure go great with this heat.